Speaking of gurus, uh, so one of the things that has been a central theme, it seems like, though, of your connection to others is the fact that that connection, though, uh, involves service to others. And uh, it seems as though uh, this is a message of many individuals who, uh, I don't know if you want to use the word guru or other terminology, of people who uh, others look to as a GPS, but it seems as though there is always a centrality of a recognition of our oneness and uh, from uh, that uh, a recognition that our life is one of service. If uh, there is a, there's a certain contradiction in the question in the sense, if there is oneness, where is the question of service? Now, I'm asking all of you, if you get to do something for your children, do you feel that you've done a great service? Hmm? Do you? No. Yeah. It's a privilege that you have the opportunity to do this. But if you happen to do something for that urchin who is on the street, who is helpless, suddenly it becomes service. Or in other words, when your heart is bereft of love, you can do service. If you have love in your heart, you can never do enough in this life. Two hands are not enough. This is the experience of every human being, whether you are in love with one person or whatever. Even if you are in love with one person, when you are really in love with one person, these two hands are not enough. How much ever you do, it's not enough, isn't it? When there is no love, you keep accounts of all the things that you do and it's a service. And if you do a lot of service, you will create such an unre unrealistic expectation about people that invariably it will lead to frustration. Activity, when you… if you really see, suppose your little finger is rotting up, if you attend to this, is this service? If you have experienced the oneness of the existence, there would be no such thing as service. It would be just expanding yourself to do whatever you can do is a natural process. In our lives, if we do not do what we cannot do, that's not an issue. But if we do not do what we can do, we are a disastrous life. Whatever we can do must happen and we as a generation of people are in a unique space for the first time, for the very first time in the history of humanity. Even twenty-five years ago, this would not be possible. For the very first time, we have the necessary resource, capability and technology to address every human problem on the planet. The only thing that is missing is inclusiveness in the way we are experiencing ourselves. If there is a more inclusive experience of yourself and the rest, every other life on this planet, we are capable of offering solutions to everything for the first time in the history of humanity. The question is, are we going to just sit on the threshold and die or are we going to cross it? This is the big question. I want to see that we as a generation of people, do not become a vain generation that we will do things that we can do. What we cannot do, it's fine. <clears throat> In some ways this brings up though the issue of, uh, as has been quoted, eighty-five people have more resources in terms of financial capability than 3.5 billion people. <laughs> Uh, which is extraordinary. Uh, and uh, certainly in the United States we see this ever-widening divergence between the haves and the have-nots. And while I think we would all agree that within ourselves we have the capability to change or the potential, uh, both 
why don't we have that, or why does not so many people seemingly have this intent? In fact, uh, as we were discussing sometimes, uh, having more makes individuals want more, not to give more. See, uh, whatever 2 to 5 percent of the population holding over 80 percent of the world's wealth, that's what it is, I don't know if that statistic is perfect, but somewhere near that. One thing is, we can see it as a great problem, but I see it as a great possibility. Now you have to change only two percent of the population to transform the world <laughs> Unfortunately, that two percent never shows up in meetings like this. They need not because… Uh, because they don't show up, because we have developed this in the world right from the time of Marx, you know, Karl Marx, I'm talking about his… No, I'm not so supposed to talk about him in the valley, but I'm talking about him. He might have known a lot of e about economics, but he doesn't know much about human nature. He predicted that the richest countries in the world will take to communism. Just the reverse happened. Wherever the poorest populations are there, they are the ones who fly the red flag even today. Yes? So, poorest talking about communism means those who have nothing to share want to share. Those who have something to share become cautious about this whole thing, naturally. <laughs> if I have a lot and I say, I want to share it with you, who will suspect me? I got nothing and I'm talking about sharing. This is dangerous policy. <laughs> so, we need to change the equation. It is not for those who do not have to talk about sharing, because what little they have, they're not willing to share. They're expecting somebody else who have a lot to share, what little they have, they cannot share. So, the transformation, to bring about a transformation in the world, we are in a better place than ever before because the wealth is accumulated in five percent of the population. The power has accumulated in the hands of twenty-five to thirty people in the, popular, in the world. If you transform these twenty-five, thirty people, the world will change. That is not… that doesn't look like an impossible thing. But if you tell me you're going to make seven point two billion people meditate tomorrow morning, I will say that's a hopeless goal. But we want to make two percent of the world to meditate and experience life in a larger way than the way they're experiencing right now. It is for sure a possibility, isn't it? <laughs> what does Sarah Palin say? Good luck with that one. Um, uh, well, I, uh, yes, uh, I certainly appreciate that uh, uh, example, but. Uh, you know, if we were compared it to a nut, the, the have-nots have a very thin shell sometimes and are more open to have their shell cracked because they have nothing to lose. Uh, while the perception is among these people, I would suggest to you, they have an extraordinarily thick shell and sometimes even an atom bomb doesn't seem able to crack that shell. So while that may take up two percent of the nuts, and I use that term <laughs> both uh, literally and figuratively. Um, <laughs> I, must, I must tell you this. <laughs> I, I, have, uh, I have had the, um, uh, you know, the opportunity and the privilege to be among those two percent of the people in the economic forums and various other, you know, business situations. And what I found is, at least ninety percent, eighty percent of them, let me be critical, eighty percent of them are fantastic human beings. It is just that there is a structure to climb and suddenly asking them to break the structure is not practical and it's not going to work. There may be about fifteen percent or maximum twenty percent of the people are super arrogant about what they have accumulated. but the rest of them, I have always found it's a pleasure to talk to them because they're brilliant people. They're not successful for nothing. They're brilliant people. And believe me, it is not love, it is not compassion, it's not other things which is going to change this world. 
it's just sense. We just have to have sensible human beings. Sense is what needs to be kindled. If you're sensible, you understand the only way that all of us can live well, the only way we can exist in a certain way on this planet is by doing certain things. This sense is easy to bring into people who have a certain level of intelligence naturally and they have exercised this intelligence to accumulate because that is how we have structured the society. Everybody is trying to accumulate but now we are talking against people who have managed to do it. We have not created a social structure where it's of a different nature. The social structure right from the school is how to be better than the guy who is standing next to you. So those who are successful, we should not resent that ever. It's very important. It is important the success is acknowledged. It is just that we want to make success more universal, not so narrow. There is a saying in the African lore, when the lion feeds, everybody gets to eat because he doesn't eat everything, okay? He eats select parts, rest, others eat anyway. So similarly, this whole economic engine that we have created is of a certain kind where human consciousness is not shaping the commerce. Commerce is shaping the human consciousness. This is a topsy-turvy way of creating the world. We are bound to pay a huge price for this. It is like if we succeed, we will fail. That's our situation. There is a, <laughs> there's a proverb in India about uh, a classic situation like this, where a man is sitting on the wrong end of the branch and cutting the branch. When he succeeds, he will fail. That is the kind of economic model that we have created. If it really succeeds, if all the seven billion people become super successful, that means end of the world. Yes. So now, we have to have the courage that we have come this far, we have to have the courage to dismantle something that is successful and remodel this. But we will wait for it to fail and then remodel it, which is a silly way of doing things. We must have the courage to change the model of how we have constructed this world when it's humming with success. Do we have the wisdom and the courage and the consciousness to do this? That's a question. But for that to happen, we don't have to change seven billion people on the planet. If we change the consciousness and the mindset of a hundred people on the planet, it can happen. Easily. <laughs> I'm not saying it's easy or not. It is a possibility. Between the possibility and the reality, there is always a distance to walk. Do we have the commitment and the courage to walk the distance? That's all the question is. Well, I think that begs the question, who's doing the walking? Uh, uh, I, I mean, uh, they're there, we're here, uh, but it's getting… No, I want to tell you a successful story of this. It's about eleven years ago. A few responsible people in India came to one of our programs in the center. Then they saw the projects and the works and whatever we were doing, and then they said, Sadhguru, this is great, but what about the nation? I said, say, I don't have to go and do everything in the nation, that's not practical, but we can do this. I have a list of two thousand people who can make a difference for this country. They are in different levels of leadership. I am not talking about Prime Minister, Chief Minister. They come and go in five years. But there is another set of leadership which stays there for twenty-five to thirty years in position. If you transform these two thousand people, you will see the country will change. They said, two thousand people? Well, I can get all of them, he said. I said, get them. Just get them to me for four days, well, you know, in batches. In four years or five years, they said they will do it. Now it's almost eleven years, we have touched about forty-five to forty-six percent of them. And quietly they're transforming the country, no question about it. There is no fireworks happening, 
But transformation is like this. When the flower blossoms, there is no band being beaten. It just happens quietly. And it is for sure happening, believe me. I am hands-on in touch with these people in many different levels. Have they changed everything? No. I am saying if ten percent of the way they think and feel about everybody around them changes, there is a huge change and they are definitely doing it. So these are business leaders, bureaucratic leaders, various people at different strata. They hold responsible positions for twenty-five to thirty years in the life of that nation and that's making a big difference. That may be true in the context of that, that example, but again, getting back to the 85 people who are not bound to a country tradition or a uh, <laughs> connection perhaps to any particular uh, philosophy. Uh, and I think as we've seen in this country, uh, and it has been a reality shown by economists, this idea of uh, uh, creating situations where the wealthy, the extremely wealthy are able to make 10, 10 20, 30, 40 percent on their money every year fundamentally because they have access that no one else has and allows them to accumulate more and continue this separation. And then we talk about trickle-down economics, which there's not one example where that has ever worked. And it's like the example so far, and again, I'm not against transformation, I'm just talking about at least the reality that I've seen where <clears throat> we have very seldom, if ever, seen despots, dictators, or people in high levels of power voluntarily give up that power. I'm not at all. This is the whole thing. See, when it is spoken from outside, they feel threatened and they will only tighten their fortresses. That's why I brought in the example of Marx. He thought the rich will do it, but the poor want it and it never worked. It's a great idea but gone bad because you're trying to work it from the wrong end. If Marx had, Marx had devices to transform the consciousness of the wealthy and then he talked about communism, that would have been the most fantastic thing, okay? But now you're going on the street and those who have nothing are talking about sharing, now it becomes ugly. Now, this… whatever these eighty-five people that we're talking about, get me ten of them, just one weekend. I will see that they transform the remaining seventy-five. I'm… I'm not somebody who lives in some dream state. I'm very much grounded. I know this may look very… looking at the world, the realities of the world, I understand very much where you're coming from. It's not that I have not faced that situation. Every day I'm against a wall, okay? But a wall is not an impossible thing. A wall need not be broken. You can always have the skill to climb across or you can make the other guy climb across. I totally agree with you. Let, let me give you an interesting example. Uh, I uh, have frequently been asked to speak at Aspen and typically uh, it's associated with having uh, an event with affluent people. And, uh, and sometimes in those situations I feel like somebody in the zoo, you know, they brought this particular animal out to look because that's a favorite animal that week. And, uh, uh, and so, <laughs> so uh, I got invited to an event following a talk at an individual's house. And I would suggest to you that this home, which was only 30,000 square feet, uh, uh, probably was worth a significant amount of money in that area. And the gentleman who was hosting it was in his 80s, and he was a survivor of the Nazis a a as a teenager and had become an extraordinarily successful businessman. And when you walk into his home, there is probably a painting that's twelve feet high of him uh, standing with his skis with the mountain behind him. And I'm sure that there's no ego involved there. <laughs> and then he proceeds to have a conversation with me, and I'm not quite sure because I wasn't particularly important, but he has a conversation with me, and in the conversation he points to his watch. He says, see this watch? That cost a million dollars. So he said, there's only ten in the world. 
is I can show you my garage. It's a 10-car garage. There's $10 million in cars. See, a boy who escaped the concentration camp, he's bound to have these things. You should excuse him for those things. Oh, no, 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 but, uh, but here, let me tell you the rest of the story. And I'll, I'll go through this very quickly, and I appreciate your comment. So, as part of this conversation he's having with me, he says, you know, in my entire life, I've never felt loved or have been able to give love, which is horrible, right? Here, this man who nominally has everything has nothing. So <clears throat> I talking to him, and it turns out he's divorced and he has children who are there, actually. And uh, I, after this uh, conversation for a while, I say to him, if you meet with me for one hour a day for the next 10 days, I will change your entire outlook on life, and you will have love. I guarantee it, just like the men's warehouse guy, right? <laughs> so, do you know his, so do you know his first question is, how much will it cost? So I say, it will, now this man's worth around a billion dollars. I say, it'll cost you $100,000 an hour but I guarantee it. He looks at me for a little bit. He says, how about 50? <laughs> okay, so then his daughter overhears this conversation and she says, Papa, uh, you should do it. She goes, in fact, this is his daughter. She said, I would give up my entire inheritance to see you happy. Because I've never seen you happy in my entire life. Do you know his response is? You don't understand the value of money. And that's how our conversation ended. <laughs> uh, this is. Uh... I'm not sure if I could have done it in 10 hours. <laughs> No, I could have done it for free. <laughs> <laughs> and for any of you out there, I will do it, I'll try. <laughs> uh, we, need to, we need to come to terms with this. Today, uh, all of you are here in the United States of America, enjoying the comforts that you're enjoying, with a lot of complaints, of course not understanding, at least materially, you are living in the best possible space that you can live in, okay? And this has all happened because you chose a certain model of economic policy. This policy of capitalism was a sensible thing to choose when you only thought of your nationalistic way of existence, when you saw the rest of the world as a source for your whatever. That system will not work in future. It may work for another twenty-five years. After that, it will not work. We have to rejig this whole thing. But first of all, you must decide whether you want a market economy like this or you want socialism or communism. You must decide. If you go for market economy, some people will race ahead. If you're going to resent them, then you must go for communism. If you go for communism, some people will tell you what to eat, what to wear, where to sit, where not to sit. If that's okay with you, it's fine. I'm saying you cannot choose to go in this direction and long to go in this direction. Every system will have its negativities. But I'm saying right now because we're talking about transforming the world by transforming an individual human being, I think it's a tremendous possibility right now that the wealth is concentrated in a few individuals' hands. If you transform them, every human being is willing to transform if you approach him properly. For a man who values money so much, whoever the person that you're talking about, because he's come up, you can understand a guy, a boy, a little, a young boy who escaped concentration camp and who came to a new place, you know, in the really a new world, literally, and built his life, he thinks in a certain way. He's added up from pennies to billion dollars, okay? From one penny, two penny, he's come to billion dollars, so that's all he thinks. 
You shouldn't have talked money to him, if you ask me. You should have offered it to him. If you spend one hour with me, I'll give you a hundred thousand dollars <laughs> This is my deal. If you bring these eighty-five… This, this is a no, dream, no, no, if you bring these eighty-five people to me, I will give them a hundred thousand dollars each. They have to spend a weekend with me, willingly. I'll spend a weekend for a hundred thousand. <laughs> you, you don't have the money <laughs> I'm Jesus, saying you have… Everybody, let's all spend a weekend <laughs> You have to do it the way it works. We are living in this world, we have to do it the way it works in this world. People come to me always, you know, even in the foundation, we are a little over thirty-six hundred full-time volunteers and over three million part-time volunteers. That's amazing. Complaints and complaints and complaints, every day the number of complaints that I handle, you would, <laughs> would kill you, okay? So people come to me and say, Sadhguru, I can't bear with this person, I can't work with this person. I tell them, see, this is the kind of people we have on this planet. If you want to work with ideal people, go to heaven today, <laughs> leave today. If you want to do some work in this world, these are the people <laughs> Actually, um Perhaps on that note, um, maybe we should open it up to uh, some questions. And there are microphones that are placed. Difficult questions for him, nice questions for me. No, 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 you can ask me any question. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my question is actually on Bharat, uh, since the government there is going to be changing pretty soon. and. I wanted to find out, you know, Hinduism concentrates a lot about inner transformation, but I see a lot of lack of, you know, a social consciousness and service, or as you term, uh, you know, going out and um, having a sense that, you know, this is my country. How, what do you see needs change in India? Why do you think it's lacking? Sorry? Why do you think it's lacking? I think because from early on, I mean from ages… No, no, not… Uh, why, why do you come to this conclusion that it's lacking? I see it. No, it's not true. You, you were looking at it from a… Uh, you're trying to put a, a template, a Western template on India, which we… we're very proud that we are like a cosmic chaos. <laughs> you understand? <laughs> We feel homesick if there's too much order. <laughs> Do not misunderstand that as lack of, uh, you know, passion for what it is. There's enormous passion. You should see, you just see, there is no other nation where such a large democratic exercise happens the way it happens in India. No other country on the planet can fulfill that, believe me. You should see how it happens. Even the poorest, in the remotest possibility where there's no road or electricity, even there he gets to vote, okay? It's a big thing. Anyway, what is the possibility? The next five years, if we'll be scintillating for India, probably ten years. So, big changes are going to happen for sure because what has been lacking for India is, an Indian has never been the leader of the country. When I say this, I'm saying our education systems in India have been such, once we get English educated, our brains are in green which mean time. <laughs> yes. So, there is no there is… there has not been a leadership who understands people the way they are. Somebody who will not ask Indian people to fit into another format which is not theirs. They made them… they made ordinary people feel ashamed just because they don't know how to speak English. They can speak their mother tongues fluently, but people are ashamed that they can't speak English. 
When you… See, nation is just an idea, let's understand this. It's not some God-given thing, it's just an idea. If you invest certain passion in this idea, nation becomes strong. When you're ashamed of being who you are, how will there be passion about it? For the first time, we are having a leadership which is passionate about who we are, okay? This is very important. This is over a ten, twelve thousand year old culture, which is so complex that you cannot put it into simple logical analysis that you normally put other societies into because it is too complex and it's too multi-dimensional, multi-ethnical, everything multi, okay? It needs a very organic leadership, not a synthetic leadership which drops there because somebody is somebody's son or daughter, okay? That's what has happened in the last thirty years. Next question. <laughs> Thank you very much for being here. Um, I, I'm wondering of other ways that you would suggest of turning that and walking the four miles instead of the twenty-four thousand miles. You mentioned perhaps finding a guru was one way, so that was one question. And also, how does one find a guru here in the United States? Thank you. <laughs> now, uh, y you must understand the basic human predicament. All that you experience, all that you experience, light and darkness, pain and pleasure, agony and ecstasy, whatever, whatever, everything that you experience happens within you. Is that so? Hmm? Do you see me right now? Do you see me right now? Where am I? Use your hands and point out. Ah, you got me all wrong. You know, I'm a mystic. <laughs> now this light is falling upon me, reflecting, going through your lenses, in what you'd imagine the retina. Where do you see me now? Within yourself. Where do you hear me right now? Within yourself. Where have you seen the whole world? Within yourself. Have you ever experienced anything outside of yourself? Your entire experience of life happens only within you. So what is happening within you to make it happen the way you want it is not something that's beyond you. It is just that right now all the five sense organs, the five faculties of perception are all outward bound. If I do this, you can hear this. But so much activity in the body, you cannot hear this. If an ant crawls upon your hand, you can feel it. So much blood flowing, you cannot feel it. In the very nature of things, sense organs are outward bound because they're survival, they're instruments of survival. But the seat of your experience is within you. This is your fundamental predicament. You need a sense which can turn inward. If you have access to the basis of your experience, would you create highest level of pleasantness for yourself or misery? Definitely highest level of pleasantness, isn't it? The problem is not of intent, the problem is of access. So, do you need some guidance on this? For sure you do. So don't use the word guru, because it's supposed to be a four-letter word in California. It has all kinds of wrong connotations. Is, is it you, GPS? Yeah, GPS. <laughs> right now, if you buy the GPS, you buy from the best company, yes, whichever is working well. The same thing you must do. You must ask the maximum number of people. If it's working well for all of them, you can do it too. And anyway, if you buy a GPS, you're not committed to it for life. If it works, you keep it, otherwise you throw it. <laughs> same thing with me <laughs> I'll give you something. If it works, you keep it, otherwise throw it. What's the problem? You're paying more to buy a pair of shoes. She's asking hundred thousand dollars an hour. No. <laughs> I'm just I'm just asking for the costs of the hall and the microphone and the stuff, okay? Because I have produced a large, a large, large, a huge mass of slaves. 
who are willing to work seven days of the week, 365 days to provide this for you. You understand? Do not waste their lives. Make it happen for yourself. Do what you don't do. I think you must look at yourself very carefully because the children are picking up everything rapidly and they'll exaggerate everything that you're doing. So one foremost thing is at least make yourself in such a way that you would like to be. Somebody may not approve, it doesn't matter. At least you made yourself in such a way that you like the way you are. Gurus, no, women will not make good gurus, nor will men make good gurus. Unless you know how to be beyond the two, you can't be this. If you're a man or a woman, if you're stuck with your gender, then there's no chance of being a guru because you're looking at the mechanics of life in a completely different way. You're just looking at life as life. All the problems on the planet is simply because everybody has their own mission. And these missions are creating variety of conflict. If all of us sit here without any mission, mission means an assumed position of importance and agenda, individual agenda. If all of us can sit here, what is a human being longing for, every human being? All of you, wherever you are right now, you would like to be little more than what you're right now, isn't it so? Hello? Yes. If that little more happens, what? Little more? If that happens, what? So it looks like in installments you're going towards something. How much more would settle you for good? Let's look at it right now.